Hey everyone, welcome to the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast, a new episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast already. This is Willem Vanderhorst, your host. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to remove or if I'm going to be able to adjust any of the echoey sounds that are going to be recorded today. My, If ever you were wondering, the few people uh, listening, I, I'm not sure you're wondering about this, but if you're wondering what the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast recording studio looks like, well, today it looks like the empty apartment I'm just about to vacate in the south of France. Yeah, I've been staying in the sunny south of France for the last past year, pretty much. My family lives in the south of France. My sister has a vineyard here. My little brother has a restaurant. My parents live nearby. Uh, so yeah, so I've been working from the south of France, traveling quite a lot between London, Paris, and some other parts of Europe in the past year. But now I'm moving, going back to the big city. And, uh, it's my last night in Perpignan. Uh, so I'm trying out to record some of the intros because I'm going to have some, a bunch of work coming up and I need to be able to have it in the box, basically. Don't forget, you can always find the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast on iTunes. It would be great if you can check iTunes, subscribe on iTunes, give us a rating or a review. I've just learned we've been noted on the new and noteworthy section. So, if you give me a rating or review, this is helping me climb through the ranks and help allow more people to just randomly discover this podcast and hopefully enjoy it. If you enjoy it, of course. If ever you don't enjoy it, just, you know, send me an email. Tell me why. I hope to readjust and do better next time. It's still at the very beginning. It's only a few episodes in. And, uh, and you know, I want to find new people to talk to. I want to get better with my interviews. And it's all very exciting. Uh, but on to today's guest. Today's guest is a fellow strategist with a lot more experience than I have, John Griffiths. I've met him a few times. He's got loads of experience in loads of different projects. He's, he's like done just about everything 10 years before they were trendy. And uh, his website is just a wealth of information about branding, advertising, marketing, new technologies, all sorts of stuff. We talk about all of this during the podcast. Uh, but the main thing is that he's promoting this book that he's written, co-written with uh, another strategist and futurist now, actually, sorry, called Tracy Follows, and it's a book called 98% Pure Potato that you can still pledge for on unbound.co.uk, and it's the book is going to be a history of the Department of Account Planning and Strategy. So for people who work in advertising, so this is like strategy-centric. If you're not interested, I don't know if this is the right thing for you, but I think it's interesting for everyone. This is the origins of the kind of people, the original madmen in the 60s that made up an entire new department to be able to include consumers, people, basically, in the process of advertising. And we also talk in the podcast about the differences, some of the differences about the TV show Mad Men and how the people he interviewed who were there back in the day in the 60s, how it was for them. So he's talked to particularly people in the UK because this is where this discipline started. And uh, we talk about all the many different people that he's interviewed, all the different projects John has worked on, and it's an exciting conversation. John, welcome to the show. To the show, well, rather. To talk to you this morning or this afternoon. Thank you very much for taking time. I really appreciate that. Okay. Uh, so we've uh, we've met a couple of times before. Uh, well, when I we caught up for coffee a few months ago, and I think we've met at a networking event years ago already. And yes. every time I, I meet you, I really enjoy all the different stories you have about the origin of strategic planning and advertising. And you're, I, I, I believe you're a fount of knowledge. Plus, you've talked to a lot of people in advertising and, and in our job in, uh, in planning. So I thought it'd be really, really great to find out more about what you're up to these days and talk a little bit overall of your career. Sure. Um, but usually I start with a warm-up question. Okay. And I was just trawling your websites and looking at a few different things. Uh, and I was hesitating what kind of question to ask you, but I think I'll start with music. I, okay. I remember reading that you were in, well, number one, you play acoustic guitar, jazz, I believe. Yeah. And uh, that you were playing in Romania after a conference until the wee hours? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, there's some video clips of it that no one will ever see. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. What um, kind of music do you play? What's your inspiration? All sorts of stuff. Uh, that that in itself is a whole conversation. Um, now, I took it over because I um, was uh, in a cafe in Romania, and there was a couple of guys playing there. I borrowed a guitar and sat in with them. 
And I said to them, next time I come back to Romania, I'll play guitar with you. And you could see the guys just thinking, that's never going to happen. And I have what's called an invisible guitar, which mm-hmm. is uh, not the expensive Yamaha one, but a much cheaper one, Ari- an Aria. And it basically allows you, it's a board, it's a plank with strings on it, but it's like Spanish, it's classical. So um, it allows you to take the, the wire sides off it and you put it over your shoulder. And uh, I think British Airways has a policy that always allow musicians to put their instruments in the cabin. Otherwise, don't travel for it. Never take an instrument anywhere near a plane. So mm. I took it with me the next time because I was able to take it cabin luggage. And the very evening I went in, um, uh, the restaurant we happened to be at, this guy was playing that. So I said, hey, when are you playing next? And um, the guy I was eating with, uh, Costin Radu, it was his birthday, two or three days later. So this guy turned up with his stuff, and we ended up jamming to about three or four o'clock in the morning. And as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't get any better than that. I'm not saying it was good playing. I'm just saying it was very cool to just hang out in a city with new friends and yeah. play guitar. It is one of the best things about traveling to be like those random encounters and random events that happen. Absolutely. And, you know, what normally happens there is that you're doing, you know, somebody's doing you a favor by lending you an instrument. So after like two songs, of course, you have to give it back. But if you can mm. take it home, then frankly, until they tell you to shut up. <laughs> you, you <go. laughs> so if we go back to the beginning of your, I, I believe you, where are you from in the UK to start with? Oh, well, I'm not. I was okay. born. I was born in Singapore. I was raised in Japan. Uh, I came back. I regard myself, I mean, my parents are British citizens, but uh, I keep on having troubles because I was born in a British crown colony, which is no longer a crown colony. So I'm not even seen as having British birth. So if my parents were born in Britain, I would have a uh, nationality problem. So um, I regard myself as British educated and naturalized here afterwards. Wow. That's, that's almost. And so how long did you spend in Japan then? Until uh, I was nine. Oh, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's almost putting my kind of mixed international origins to shame. It's more, it sounds more exotic. It's great. And well, did you keep some Japanese? Did you learn some? Or? Uh, I lost it all. I went to Japanese kindergarten, then went off to a, a Western school and lost it. But then I when it. I was working um, as part of the Dentsu Network, um, and much later as a planner, I had to go back and do the trip to go and visit the Honda mothership. And I, um, I persuaded Dentsu to pay for some of us to have Japanese spoken lessons. So I got to a basic certificate. Uh, okay. back then. But the interesting thing was that um, the, the grammar is not, not really there, the vocabulary not really, but the pronunciation, it's there. Mm. So I transcribed my, um, my short presentation and delivered it in faultless Japanese, which kind of blew the room away because I shouldn't have sounded like that. Wow. Amazing. So I can do that. And you studied uh, philosophy, right? I studied philosophy in English in Edinburgh. Um, it's part, I mean, it, it took me a while to get into advertising, um, but I, I, I was looking for a job in advertising which combined creativity with thinking for a living. Yeah, and, and how, been, but how, what was the link between the moment you were you studying and starting to be interested in advertising? Is there something that happened there? Uh, yeah, I was out of ideas, and a guy offered me a job in Australia in an advertising <laughs> And I thought that advertising was disgraceful and immoral, but I thought a job in Australia sounded very cool. Mm. So I, um, I gradually overcame my scruples and had tried to get to Australia, and they wouldn't give me a visa. Oh. So, uh. Even though uh, you had the job? Yep. Okay. I was, I, well, it was like as an internship or as a trainee, there's no reason why an Australian kid couldn't have done it. Mm. So uh, there, were no, there was no way I was going to be given that job. So uh, I basically turned my attention to getting a job in, in advertising in Britain, and I eventually got into uh, an agency. I went back to college and did a kind of advertising course um, and then used that uh, to kind of get a series of internships. And I was originally going in to be a copywriter, but then everyone I talked to said, you talk too much, uh, you think too much, you argue about the strategy, you should be a planner. So I realized that all the things I was trying to do weren't getting you anywhere near to a creative job. Uh, so eventually I worked my way across to being a planner. So I don't know if your listeners know what a planner is, but basically the way yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's, let's just take a second to explain the process of what happens behind the walls of an advertising agency and what, what a planner does. That'd be great. Okay. Well, there's a, there's a kind of, um, series of power relationships in an agency. Um, creativity is still very important and is fetishized. Uh, clients are very important and they're fetishized because whatever they say goes because they're paying. Um, and, but the danger is that with that unholy, uh, duality is that you don't get good work. You get work that the client likes, which doesn't work very well. I'm not saying the clients don't know what they're doing, but that's why they went to a creative in the first place. And the creatives 
off, will often pursue creativity to the exclusion of whether it has any connection. It may be great for the collective subconscious, mm. um, but it's not that relevant necessarily to the way people actually use products. Mm. So um, the, 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 this role of planning came about, which has a component of research, but an awful lot of it is to do with how on earth is this advertising going to work? What role does it play? And when you put that in as a kind of counterbalance, it means with an agency, you should have an element of grounding where it's all about saying, well, yes, we support creativity and we're there to make it even more creative if we can. We're also there to make sure it's commercially effective. But unless it plugs into what ordinary people do or don't do with advertising, it's not, it's going to fail. So yeah. that's the role of that. So what ordinary people do with uh, the way that they receive advertising, well, adverts, or the way they look at billboards, or or the way they buy products? I mean, it's the whole way through, right? All of that. It's yeah. all of that. And one of the um, most, to me, one of the most key things about this is that um, advertising is sometimes, at certain cycles uh, of development, is interesting to the general population, but mostly it isn't. Mostly yeah. it's not. Yeah. So, um, one of the things which, um, advertising people really can't cope with is the utter trivia of advertising and the fact that it works because you don't notice it most of the time. It works indirectly. And th- to make great advertising, you have to obsess over it. Mm. So how do you cope with the fact of getting a bunch of people to obsess to produce something great and to actually ground it so you make the most of it, the fact that for most people, it's trivial, and you have to charm people into paying any attention to it whatsoever. That's what the whole piece is. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. And you you are, uh, at the moment, working on a book, I believe. Uh, well, you've been writing a book and interviewing a lot of the people who started this discipline called account planning in yeah. the 60s, right? Yeah. I should explain the planning term is a very odd one, because sure. um, people assume that planners are kind of very good at organizing, and if you meet any planners, you discover that they're not. <laughs> um, planning is really the process of implementing so that a creative idea and a business um, strategy becomes implementable with people who don't give a stuff about it. That's really why it's called planning. Yeah. But it's a helpful term, and increasingly now, um, planners like to call themselves strategists and then have long discussions about the difference between planning That's and a question I was going to have for you on like, what you thought of <laughs> that particular but <laughs> later. later. <laughs> So, um, I've forgotten your question now. Uh, uh, that's okay. The, uh, just to explain in the book, 98% okay. of the Um, one of the things that I did when I uh, set up my consultancy, um, was to set up a website to promote issues about planning, mainly because I felt that the kind of planning I've been doing, which is in the integrative areas I've been working through the 1990s, right across direct marketing, sales promotion, sponsorship, uh, PR, and putting it all together. And um, because of that, I had something to say. So, so I put together this website and, and um, found myself uh, with all sorts of freelancers. Instead of competing with them, I asked them to come on the site. Um, I used to read a lot of books by people I admired. I not only review their books and put them on the site, I would also interview them. Yeah, like I'm interviewing you now. I saw that you had podcasts so, from like over 10 years ago. Well, I was podcasting from 2004, but we didn't have broadband then. So yeah. I would have to cut up the, the interview and slice it up because I didn't think anyone would have bandwidth to, to download one sixty seconds at a time. You but seem to be ahead of a lot of trends. There's also a, one of the <laughs> websites you have is is recording a trip that you have like an Instagram account, except that it was like a ten or eleven years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was <laughs> that was because I got a Nokia phone, which had a whole thing about m- mobile blogging, and I was traveling as a planner in Croatia, Saudi Arabia, whatever, and so I used this crazy product. We started doing video blogging. It didn't work most of the time. I had to kind of do it on the computer and then upload it to the phone. But in principle, I have a record of what it was like to take photos and then to work through that. So, yeah, I mean, even though the technology was not helping me, uh, that was something I did. Um, but I mean, sorry, that just to... to, to sorry, to, yeah, I'm adding too many yeah. stuff. Just... Yeah, to pause, please, start me off at your peril. But the point was that I started interviewing people because when you do research as I do, to have a, a, a digital recorder with you is, is something really easy. You just put it down and you ask questions and you talk. Yeah. So, so I started um, talking to people I admired who were writing books and um, that became a whole sort of stream of interviews. And I had had Stephen King, one of the guys who invented the camp planning. Uh, I had his email for a year and he died. And I just couldn't believe it uh, that I could have contacted him and I missed him. Mm. So I kind of made myself a vow that at some point I would talk to the earliest guys that did this job 
at some point. In 2012 was when the time came. And so I got from Julie Lannan, who set up the Quoll, the Creative Research Unit at Thompson's in 1968. I got the the, um, the names of as many planners as she could remember and the contact details. She didn't have many. And I just went on a big detective thing until I had tracked down um, 20 people from the two earliest agencies where account planning started. And then um, I just got an hour off each of them, audio recorded and videoed them, got transcribed. Um, Tracy Follows, who's my fellow writer, um, was just moving to be Chief Strategy Officer at J. Wallace Thompson, one of the key agencies. So that was helpful. She was also on the committee of the account planning group and about to become the chair of the APG. That was useful. <laughs> so, so that's the way the whole thing developed. It's taken a long time to get the book out. It's coming out, um, it's been published, uh, May of next year. Um, we crowdfunded it through the publisher Unbound, UK. Mm-hmm. So that took a fair amount of time. In the interval, um, I decided I wanted to strengthen the book. Um, because I then decided, well, I've got 20 interviews, and frankly, I could go on interviewing forever. But you have to stop somewhere and start to write. So once the book was written, I thought, well, these planners are great, but they're not really giving me the context. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, I found expert witnesses who've been account men, clients, creators, and so on, around these first agencies. And that gave me an, an extra level of interest. I wanted to have a cutoff point between 1962, 1963, and 1980, um, but it was interesting that there were people who were involved in these agencies who went on to do really significant things in other in other agencies, other parts of the world. So that's why I went back to people like Dave Trott, um, Adam Lurie, um, Jeff Howard Spink, people who were very expert commentators. The guy writing the foreword is a guy called John Bartle, who people will know because of a little agency called Bartle, Bogle, Hegarty. What makes it incredibly cool is that the reason he was the right foreword is, is he was the first ever client for planners in 1966, because he was a research manager for Cadbury's, Bournemouth at the time. Right. So here's someone who's seen it all the way through before he then set up his first planning department at TBWA and then went to start his own agency, Barton Bogle Hegarty, in 1983. So you get people in there having a point of view, and suddenly you've got something which is unique. And you know, the, the issue with when you're writing books or, or, or following things through is you have to get published within a certain period of time, otherwise it's out of date. Yeah. This isn't out of date in the sense that these guys are evergreens. They are some of the greatest and smartest and most creative people we've ever had working in this particular trade. And they basically made it up. So, you know, that's why I think the book's important. That's why I'm passionate about it. Um, where I suppose I hope the book will be successful, but I doubt it, is that I think it will be of interest to people working in advertising. If you don't work in advertising, I'd love you to read the book. I suspect you won't, but I wish you would. Because mm. I think the thinking and the ways of doing stuff are so uh, relevant to ways of solving not only business problems, but other practical problems. I'll give you a really simple example. Yep. A silly story from John Steele, uh, one of the great planners who I also interviewed for this, although he actually falls outside the region, but he was one of the first planners working in the United States. He, uh, John had a fear of flying. And um, so he went to see his boss and he was sending him on a plane and said, look, I'm really scared. Um, I don't really like to get on a plane. His boss said, there's no problem. We can fix it. Why are you so scared? He said, because I think that someone, every time I go through the security, I think someone will put a bomb on the plane. And his boss said, oh, that's really easy to fix. And he said, how? He said, take a bomb on the plane yourself. He said, does that make any sense? He said, because the, the chances of there being two bombs on the plane are virtually infinitesimal. <laughs> that's a very private joke. But it's the idea of how you solve a problem through lateral thinking, argument, uh, and complete nonsense. That's <laughs> a nutshell. It's a great example. But how did, so did you just laugh and just go on the plane afterwards? You just laughed and went on the plane after that. Yeah. But you know, that, that, that's one of the things that I love is that you, you find in this trade people who have done the most extraordinary things. Um, there can be people who do PhDs, physics, all sorts of areas. They're also very creative people and they somehow put these two things together and they end up doing this job. Because it's about the only job which lets you do all of these things at the same time and give you a free reign to do it. And other ones kind of corral you in the person who wears suits and write presentations or the person who comes up with ideas and gets their ideas turned down 99% of the time. Actually, the planning area is a very happy, it's a very sweet spot where you get a lot of your thinking accepted. You can influence an awful lot of work. You can help a lot of great advertising happen and you get to work with the most fantastic people. Yeah. I agree. And it's one of the things I particularly enjoy about it. It's 
it's extremely vast and there's a lot of different things you can be doing at any time of day and it's, it's varied. I really like, you'd never get bored because you're working on a bunch of different stuff all at the same time. And, and one, of the, one of the things that was lovely about talking to these plants is what are you doing now? Mm. People are often lots of different things. And it's just the stories just got wilder and wilder. I mean, one guy who um, came up with, he was working on a Heineken campaign, Heineken Refreshes the Parts. Um, he plays jazz every Monday, he's retired, and he just said, well, you know, this is, it's all about improvisation. Eventually, once you've done all the work, you have to go with the flow, you just have to feel it. Um, and then there was another person who, um, uh, he wanted, he was obsessed with horse racing. Okay. So he kept, kept a horse racing career in parallel all the way through, and he ended up on the group, the global group board of, um, uh, DDB in New York. But then he went on from there to run what's called the Tote, which is the top gambling body for horse racing in the UK. So at the same time as he was working in ad agencies, he was also a horse trainer, and he claims he wrote the first ever book for planners, which was How to Train a Winning Racehorse. A really interesting guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, that's amazing. You must have had a lot of different stories from all these different people. Did it sound, you know, if you think about the TV show Mad Men, was it a lot, were a lot of stories along those lines of the kind of the Mad Men times? That's, I'm so glad you raised Mad Men, because we've been having an argument about the cover of the book. Uh, because the first design that came in was very Mad Match. Uh-huh. And um, Mad Men, yes, there's a kind of, it's got a kind of look to it, the sharp seats and so on. But all that stuff with high balls and whatever else, it's 1950s advertising. It's not actually 60s advertising. Mm. And there was a whole seat change of what happened in the 1960s. And what we've realized quite late, and we're trying to make sure this comes across in the book, is that one of the things which changed within culture and within advertising, was that instead of it being smooth guys pitching to big clients and doing kind of um, uh, fairly dreadful motivational research type pitches, hidden persuaders, that kind of stuff, there was a whole shift which planning represents, which was saying, why don't we ask what real people think? And over in the States, um, uh, Ralph Nader was getting involved with the whole, the whole consumerism movement and trying to fight the big car companies that were basically developing unsafe cars and killing people and then using their lawyers to stop anyone investigating it. So con- consumerism came through as a force in the 1960s. But if you want to find out what people, you know, for, to make products better, you had to involve real people and not just some kind of lab rats, you know, in a laboratory. Now, the interesting thing is that of all the things which have come about in planning, um, sorry, in uh, advertising, if I was to say marketing, advertising thinking, brand thinking, so it, it all came from the USA. Account planning came from the UK. Why is that? Because there was something quite unique about saying we're going to put people in the centre, not as lab rats, not detached from the market, but we can go out of our agencies just down the road, drive an hour, and we can talk to a real person about an advertising idea. Now, the Americans could have done that. They mostly didn't. They used surveys to do, to persuade clients to run mass campaigns. Qualitative research as an idea, as a democratizing sort of consumerist idea, came from Britain. And so therefore, one of the things we want to talk about is the fact that this was the thing which displaced Mad Men. Okay. It's the next era. And therefore, no one's really talked about this. People talk about Bill Bambach and the whole movement of creativity and advertising. Bambach was actually a 1950s figure. And it's interesting that when that whole movement went through, that it actually, it got, kind of got stuck. People still made such a fuss about Ben back and his creativity. But US advertising didn't really change very much because of the sheer scale of that kind of operation. Whereas the thinking behind um, um, advertising and British creativity, by the, the reason why, for example, planning went across to the USA was because Jay Chiat couldn't figure out why CDP was such a great agency. He went to talk to him, he concluded, the only thing that was different about them is they were using planning thinking. So he went back, hired Jay Newman, uh, the 1984 uh, uh, Apple campaign was one of the first triumphs Jay Chart worked on, and virtually everything that Chart day one after that, he had planning built into it. Mm. But it's interesting that he had to come over to the UK to do that, and it's interesting that in the next 10, 20 years, Saatchi's took over a global network. Basically, the British arrived on the world stage, and I'm not saying they did it because of just planning, but there was something culturally which happened with Mad Men being an American movement and suddenly planning being a very British movement. And one of the stories that John Steele told me was they used to have these arguments because people genuinely argued 
that the Americans had the wrong kind of brain to do that. It was really? serious. Right. Because if you hadn't been taught an Oxford Cambridge style education and been taught how to debate, how to reason, how to build a case, and the American public school system apparently didn't do this, and therefore were not intellectually equipped to do planning. So there was actually a serious argument about this, which is why uh, British planners were hired at telephone number salaries to work in America for a while. So someone said, I'm not putting up this anymore. Let's have some American planners. And then we discovered that the American planners are just as good as any of the other planners. And actually, planning has become a worldwide movement. There are evidence of that. And, and now you find that planners and styles of planning are different for virtually every continent in the world. And that's what makes it so interesting. It evolves to support the creativity and the culture of the countries where it's taken. Yeah, and it evolves based on, and it changes based on, well, there's different people, different cultures everywhere in the world. And it's, it's attempting, at least, I believe, to try to get a measure of those cultures, those people, and everything else. Yes, and, and that, to me, is, is essential. If all you do is you get off a plane, you get out of schematic, and you say, we're just going to fill these boxes in, and then we're going to do something, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. What's interesting is that it, for, for planning to be effective, it has to be relevant to the client culture, and we will appreciate that client cultures in different parts of the world are very different, but most of all, it has to be relevant to the people who make it work and who pay for it. And again, because advertising is so marginal to most people's lives, Building that bridge is incredibly important, and it's done in lots and lots of different ways. Mm. So back to your career a little bit. You've worked with uh, many different advertising agencies, yep. and then then you went freelance, and you've been working for yourself for quite a long time. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, is there what what decided you to step into doing your own thing? Okay. Um, I did a stint of freelance in 1992, and I loved it. Um, mm. One. Lovely story, which I got of Mike Hall, who was the founder of the agency, uh, research agency, Hall and Partners, was that he went freelance for a morning and he called a friend after 12 o'clock and said, I can't understand this. Let's go off and get drunk. Um, so he lasted as a freelance three hours. I discovered that I loved being a freelancer. Sometimes the uncertainty of freelance work makes me feel so insecure. It gives them a stomach ulcer. They can't sleep and so I've never lost a night's sleep. Mm. However difficult things have got, I love doing this. Um, so I discovered that I liked it. And the reason why I went back into work with, a, with an agency at that point was I was offered a chance to be on the board. Yes, I have to try that. Next, I was offered a chance to be in an integrated agency. I thought I'd better try that. Um, and uh, then I was offered the chance to work on Honda at CDP when the entire account, I mean, everything down to making telephone calls, PR was inside the agency that couldn't resist that. So that was also another reason. But as soon as I had done that, and written an APG submission, I think, for APG awards, I thought, why do I need a day job? In other words, I needed a reason to be an employee. Yeah. And um, I, as soon as I couldn't think of a reason, I'd head back to freelance again. So that, that, it, it became very um, obvious to me that once I always needed a reason for a day job. And once I didn't have a reason for it, I would, um, I would, I would head straight back to freelance. That's all. Yeah. We were just talking just before I started recording about the, like, you're really prolific. You have a lot of different stuff online we talked about a little bit of it and there's a lot of content that you have i mean papers you've won awards for some of your workshops and market research yeah. uh you have a number a huge number of different articles and thinking out there online uh yeah. can you just repeat a little bit what you said as the new website that holds a lot of the yeah um i i did a as an experiment really to collect some analytical data um i uh blogged every working day of last year and in the first 100 days, because I've been doing stuff on YouTube and with a blog and with a website and being interviewed by different people, whatever, I thought, why don't I just have a kind of, um, a kind of uh, Grand Central Station where I can link to all these things. So every day for 100 days, I put a link to something else I've done so you can pretty much get the hard work. Mm-hmm. So that's the first 100 days of the blog, Postcards from the Planet. The next 100 days, I thought, well, mm, what do I do for the next 100 days? I know, I'll do a memoir. So I started off with how I got into advertising, and then I basically did a, something every day. Now, the, the thing I discovered very uh, quickly after starting to do stuff online was that as long as you only do a little bit and you do it regularly, you end up with a mass of stuff. And people don't believe how much you've done. They think I do nothing else. It's only by doing a little bit regularly, it all builds up. And obviously, mm. there has to be the quality there. Um, and so therefore, um, 
in the second hundred days was a memoir. And then I've still got what, 40 or 50 days of the, of the year left. So I therefore did um, Heroes of Mine. So it was partly my favorite authors. And then it gave me a chance to showcase the 20, uh, just over 20 people that was, were interviewed for the, for the new book. So they feature in there as well. It gives me a chance to put the book. So, um, that, that blog, I, I put things on. Um, I've most recently put, um, a series of 12 posts on there called Start of the 10, which is the idea of having a lack of tapas with planners. So you buy five out of 12 tools and I do them over three days for you. And the idea is that you don't have everything. You have to choose the four or five things that you're really interested in, but I price it at the same price as a photo screen. So the argument is I'll give you way more than you would get for a photo screen for the same price because we're using mixed methodology. The reason I put that on is because I think it'll be as interesting for people to read in three years time as it is now. Mm. Whereas the trouble with a lot of blogs is you see Donald Trump's done something and you go and sound off and it's very interesting, you get a big debate going, but in two years time, who cares? Yeah. And the, you know, from experience, I've got stuff which I quite like, but it's got deeply buried in a blog I wrote back in 2007 um, to try and keep any kind of coherent sense of the things that we're publishing and discussing with people online, we need a way to be able to filter. And so postcards from a planner is my way. Got it. And the, all this different content, do you think that like going freelance and doing your own thing has given you more time to write and experiment or, or is it more the other way around and, uh, you've been, you, well, the work has given you inspiration for doing all this stuff? Oh, that's really such a good question. I didn't know how to answer it. I think they feed off each other. Yeah. Um, that someone said, well, it's a problem I have that people, Oh, sometimes don't give me work because they don't think it's interesting. But I think you could give me anything and I can find the interest. <laughs> yeah. that, that's not, that's not to, to boast is to say, that's the kind of person I am is to look at something and say, mm, that's really interesting, isn't it? How, how do you do it? So, um, okay. <laughs> Slightly way out story. So I was asked to work on makeup. Okay. It was a makeup for Tesco, own label makeup. Women were already winking their lips and saying, I would never, ever buy an enable product. Just see the obvious problem. I can tell you truthfully, I don't wear wet makeup and I don't have the urge to wear makeup. <laughs> so why, why, what does a guy know about makeup and can he actually research it usefully? Yeah. And so, um, as part of the preparation, uh, at this time, when you're a freelance, you do all sorts of other things with your time as well as the work. And I was still collecting my kids from the school gates and I met someone who was a trainer with Virgin, um, uh, the cosmetics company, and um, she was going for advanced training. And I said, I'd love to come along. And she called me back and said, um, they're very happy for you to do the training. And I went, great. That's awesome. <laughs> so I went along with my wife as a model, <laughs> and I made her up for three hours. Really? Yeah. That's and they offered me a job at the end of it. And I said, I think it's really cool, because I could do a kind of hybrid form of research, because um, I do a hybrid form of research, because um, women could pay me to make them up and I could pay them to do market research and I'd still make a profit and I'd help them, et cetera, et cetera. And my wife said, there's no way you were ever making up any other woman, ever. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, uh, that was the end of that one. But obviously the reason for my doing this was a kind of method actor thing of mm -hmm. getting into makeup as a guy that doesn't understand makeup and it was valuable on the project. I didn't simply walk in there with my three hours of experience and then research. I, I had, um, some of our top people, um, Jill Arrow and Rachel Laws, who are experts in discourse analysis and both of them have worked on, um, cosmetics. So they worked on the transcripts that I gave them and they were able to show how the women were speaking to me and the stuff that the women weren't telling me because they could read between the lines because they were analyzing the language very specifically. So, what I'm saying is, you start off with something which is, why would you give a project like making to a guy? And then from that, not only have you got something quite out there and quite interesting, but I've got the best people in the country, if not the in Europe, working on how we get, how, how do women talk about makeup, how do they feel about it, what do we do with it? And this is a project where we interview people um, in um, stores and we then took them onto the shelves and, and, and and showed them doing stuff. So in other words, this is all part of creativity. It's not just doing focus groups and asking people damn full questions and running down everything they say. It's deep research, which is about motivation, how people are feeling and so on. 
and I'm learning as much by putting a pile of cosmetics on a table out of reach of women and watching them look at it and wondering when they're going to be allowed to play with it and yeah. what they do with each other when they get their hands on it and start to play with stuff in it. Wow. That's a fun job. So uh, what I'm saying is I think it should be possible. What, what we bring as planner researchers, when researchers involved, is a level of creativity and innovation because it's another metaphor I use is like being a chef. It costs the same as buying a meal anywhere else. So why wouldn't you pay a chef to cook a meal just for you, just the way you like it? That's the whole point. So I would argue, um, and that's where a lot of the research kind of awards came out of, that I could set up every research project which would be unique to that time and run differently to any other project that I'd run, because partly it's more interesting to do, but mainly it was more useful to the client. Well. Uh, just to make sure everybody's following us, we've talked about qualitative focus groups and quantitative research. So typically, uh, brands can find out information about market and audience by asking a lot of questions, gathering so that you have pie charts and percentages, that's quantitative, and going and talking to people to get a little bit behind what's going on, how they buy and why they buy, and that's qualitative. And uh, there has been a lot of criticism of focus groups so which is to, to get a few different people around a around a table in a room and ask them a few questions and in our industry there has been criticism of things going low towards the lowest common denominator to what and i know i've had sometimes trouble in my own experiences selling more original research ideas to clients do you have any advice for people on well well what do you think of the criticism and it, do you have any advice for selling more creative research the criticism is fair in the sense that, um, there again, there should be criticism of bad advertising. Just because you have lots of bad advertising doesn't mean you say you should never do any good advertising. So I, I'm not sure that's a fair analogy. Um, but if you sit a group of people down and you ask them questions, a lot of what they say is unhelpful. A lot of what they say is misleading. And that's why, first of all, there are people who are trained to do this, and I don't just mean the kind of person who's got the personal confidence to ask questions and to wait to hear what people say and write it down. That's not a, that's just interviewing. A anyone can do that. I would. Mm -hmm. The point of our positive research is that you are getting a group of people together where an awful lot of the stuff that they know and feel they have never ever put into words. And your job is to get them to articulate something which is beyond what they would say. If I wanted someone's opinion, I could just send them an email and they can mail me back. I'm not interested in what people think they want to tell me. I'm interested in the stuff that you will tell me that, that um, piece of advertising, the way it makes them feel, what it does, and so on. And that becomes immensely helpful. So one of the most famous, in fact, arguably the greatest ever, um, television writer and creative John Webster, who was the creative director at BNP, one of the agencies from which planning comes, if you looked around his office, he had so many awards, he put them in the cupboards. He wasn't interested in the public recognition of other creators. He didn't interest them. He actually thought it was corrupt. What was around his walls were letters from children and adults about how his advertising made them feel. Because that's what made a difference to him. He wanted to move people. He wanted to make people laugh. Uh, and he wanted to get a reaction from people. And he knew how to do it in such a way that sold products. And what was important to him was the human connection. Great research is about establishing a human connection and not simply going in, uh, putting boards in front of people, which they then turn into amateur creative directors and they say they don't like. By the way, when people create advertising themselves, and one of the ideas I've got for the Start of Pretend and methodologies, um, is to get people to write their own ads. When people write their own ads, are they create it? Absolutely not. They produce what they think an ad is, which is the sum total, or the, 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 the total average of all the advertising they've ever seen. If I ask you to write a beer ad, or a, or, a cos, or, or a cosmetics ad, or a detergent ad, you would produce something which is straight down the middle. The issue is that when we are trying to do something new and different, we have to reference the category, but we have to transcend the category. And therefore, you need not only to understand that people are going to respond based on their history, but you have to get them to respond to what is new and unfamiliar and what they like and what they don't like about it. We're not just running some kind of beauty program. I mean, there's so much more I could say. Do you have an example of, of a recent ad that I could put a, you know, I could reference and put the video of on the notes that, that, that hits the mark of what you're talking about that like kind of references back to your product category as well as transcends it? Um, 
Well, not well, it doesn't have to be recent. Just like the what an ad that I can find the video of and yeah. The danger is that I I come up with something which it was searched very badly and the narrative becomes and they ignored it and it became a huge success. And what we therefore learn from this is that you should never ask anybody anything. You should just go for your own gut and right. do stuff. Right, the, right. One of the examples, and it's not a recent one, which I apologise, and it was the one about, um, I believe it's gone out of my head. Oh, the ice cream. Hagen does. It's back. Okay, good. Perfect. Well, that way it leads us to talk about ice cream as well. <laughs> yes. In the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. We've got to talk about ice cream. We do have to talk about Hagen does. Now, the point about Hagen does was that the insight came after the book had finished. So, which so, ad was that particular? Well, oh. it was the idea. It was the idea. They'd shown a bunch of um, okay. ads to about Harvey does to people, and they said that was great, that was great, whatever. Okay. Um, but it was when the group had finished and the recorder was off, and someone said, "Yes, yeah, it's great, but you know, what what I really like about Avatar, about ice cream is it's sexy." <laughs> okay. That's it. It wasn't what was talked about at the group at all. And therefore, they, they therefore thought, hang on, we haven't got anything about advertising, uh, ice cream is sexy. Mm -hmm. So, what would advertising is sexy look like? Now, if you come back with images of advertising sexy, people uh, will die. Ice cream sexy. Ice cream, sorry, yeah, I'm saying. If you come back with um, a bunch of ads which show that ice cream is sexy, how will it research? Terrible. I think it's disgusting. I think it's um, pornographic. It's inappropriate to link ice cream to people behaving sexually. Uh, I can't even admit that I like it. But I like it. Now, this is exactly the, the issue. That something is beneath the surface. No one has permission in front of a room full of strangers to say in the, in the, in the whole thing about the thing, this is boring advertising. I want something where people are smearing ice cream at each other. No one will say that. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in Britain. <laughs> yes. okay? So because of that, and I remember being in a group which was towards, um, because we were still talking about ice cream with Bella. Yeah. Where I was um, uh, researching a concept um, for a telephone company, and someone, the, the creative group, was all about how sexy making phone calls is. And people just went, no, 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 this is stupid. This is like uh, bad puns and so on and so forth. And I said, well, it's just a convention to associate sex with a product. Um, you know, for example, I said, um, What's the connection between ice cream and sex? <laughs> it's a long silence. And the whole room started to laugh. And a woman said, would you like me to tell you? I'll even <laughs> tell you my favorite flavors. And just like the room just went eight at that point. But what I'm trying to describe, the art of research, is to get to that point where we're talking about feelings and putting stuff into words that we find it difficult to even talk about with the people that know us best. Mm. That's the art of research. And, and frankly, if you find people who have the ability to get into that sweet spot, that zone, and to take advertising ideas there, they will do outstanding creative work. The problem is you'll have someone who's being authorized to go and ask a bunch of standard bullshit questions and to write down whatever the person says, and they come back and say they didn't like it. What do you mean they didn't like it? Do you mean they were too afraid to say how much they liked it? Or what is going on here? So part of the job of research is to break that barrier down between the things that people are conscious of and unconscious of and pull that stuff out, but also to find out what is going on inside this ad. Because the best advertising does not work directly. It works under the radar, and we have to find ways of doing that. And the idea that someone sits in their agency in some swanky part of town and taps the collective unconscious and without anyone discussing it, gets it right first time. You know, that's impossible. There's been so much terrible work and terrible work by people who thought they were geniuses and they're not that. Sorry. Um, you, no. got me on my, you got me on my uh, soapbox again. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, to change topics, uh, you, you told me very quickly last time I met you, we, we caught up a couple of weeks ago, and you just started telling me about a methodology uh, that you've created a few years ago using yeah. archetypes and storytelling within brands. Yes. And plus, storytelling is a very like it's it's a very trendy word at the moment in advertising. So anyway, yeah. could you describe a little bit what the sure. what that workshop is? I I had done quite a lot of brand consulting work at the end of the nineties um, to do with developing brand characters, brand owners, and all that, and it drove me crazy. It works fine for advertising, although there is a certain paradox 
that a brand summary may have more words in it than the TV commercial or the print ad that comes out of it. There's got to be something weird about that, hello? Uh, and, and it assumes that if you want to articulate a brand, it, that writing is the best way to deal with it. That's questionable. Mm-hmm. Although writing is very useful for all sorts of reasons I can come back to. But there are limits to what writing to can do. And um, particularly when I was working on the implementation of integrated brands through different communication channels, where you're not simply doing advertising, you're doing direct response, gathering customers, customer uh, management, you're doing um, uh, uh, PR, uh, reputation work, all these things. The, the brand manifested itself in different ways, and a brand summary just didn't help. So this is when I um, got this idea of taking the brand character, and then I discovered there's a whole industry around the film industry helping people to write screenplays. Yep. It's a bit like people who make their living uh, doing internet marketing by selling courses, and this is how I market myself on the internet, and hey, if, if you pay for my course, this is what I'll do. Basically, if you can't sell a screenplay, you write a book about how to sell a screenplay. Yes. <laughs> That's what happens. So I found a number of books, and there's a whole literature there, but the one I really like was how to write a a screenplay in 120 pages, and by pen, page 10, you have to have the crisis, and by page 20, you bring in a mentor to support, and it's following Joseph Campbell. Just like storytelling and narrative structures. Oh, well, you just said the Campbell. Yeah, okay. because, because screenplays are formulaic, because Hollywood is about making money. Yes. So, therefore, you make a movie which cannot fail, and that's how Hollywood structures this stuff. So you have storytelling consultants come in and fix it, and then they write their books. So there's a ton of literature on it. Now, I thought, hang on, this gives me a fantastic um, gym for working a brand. Because the problem with brand consulting and brand summaries, brand keys, brand onions, and so on, is that first of all, the brand never changes, it's static. And that's yes. a legacy of the way brands were promoted in the 1960s and 70s. The second thing is, brands never deal with conflict. Mm. We, we actually keep conflict away from them. Yes. Whereas brands are involved in conflict all the time. Normally they're being outspent by someone else, or, or, um, or someone's ignoring them, or there's a brand crisis, or whatever. So drama is inherent in what it means to manage a brand in, in a real well. And, and here was a gym, a workout for putting a brand in. So the, the, the very simple method was to identify a brand, was to identify a genre. And I discovered that the genres didn't matter at all because genres are just backdrops or, or, or containers for putting stories in. So it doesn't matter if it's a Western, a rom-com, um, you don't worry yet? I think I have. So, you know, all, all those, those sorts of genres. And the idea is that you put the brand in there with some of its competitors, but it doesn't matter because these things simply work as characters. So one of the most useful things you can do with this, this workshop technique is with a bunch of lager brands because they all say they're individual and they all behave exactly the same. It's based on one's collective behavior when they're risk-taking and drinking too much. So yeah. a group of lager brands is almost identical. So... Okay, so the genre is a buddy movie, but your job in a buddy movie is to make sure that your hero is the winner. So in the workshop, what we do is we pick a we pick a cast, we pick a genre, we identify the character of the lead uh, the lead person, and then we storytell. We do not do any marketing for the next hour, two hours. We just tell the story, and we're trying to turn it into a screenplay. Uh, I did one for an, uh, an Islamic bank once, <laughs> and the problem was that we couldn't get him, to, uh, this, this guy who was in love with his cousin to declare his love for the girl until the last act, which is a terrible movie. He has to declare it in act two or three, and then a whole bunch of challenges come along and try and take it away. It's, it's not a good movie if you don't act five. So that was the hardest thing to do. We couldn't get him to declare his love in act three. Uh, and once we cracked that, the, the crisis which brought this on was what made the difference. What was interesting about that particular storytelling exercise was that because it was for a Saudi bank, the whole rom-com was about an arranged uh, marriage and the guy cutting out, the guy who was the most traditional Islamic brand who had arranged the marriage. And how did you get the girl in the traditional guy that was coming in and doing stuff? <laughs> so imagine that he's about to lose um, the, uh, the girl um, because the Islamic guy says, this is how it is, this is about tradition, all of those kinds of things. And... Um, it allowed us, therefore, to explore screenplay, drama, the brand's strengths within a culturally relevant context. I didn't understand any of this stuff. It was the, the uh, team uh, from the Middle East or around me who helped me to make sense of that, and we told the story. 
when you get to the end of the story and you decide that you've got a good screenplay, you take a flip chart and you say, what are the five things that were key in the development of this character which enabled them to succeed? And you write those five things out. Then you take a new sheet of paper and you write item number one, okay? The, fi- the first thing that, that was, was driving this thing. You say, I want you to give me five marketing initiatives which come out of that. Bam, 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 bam. You will not stop writing for an hour. It just pours out of you. You basically spend two hours on the right-hand side of your head with all the creativity. You're doing the marketing job. You don't even know you're doing the marketing job because you're a way better storyteller than every human being is in yep. our marketers. So yep. get them to tell stories, get them to tell something which is credible of the, of the, uh, of the character. And not only does the character change in response to the conflict, not only does the character have to seek help from mentors and other brands, but it develops. If at the end of the screenplay, the brand is identical to all the others in a buddy movie, it's failed. It's a boring movie. The brand has to be the hero. And what, what often happens is that you end up with a brand which is number two, number three in the marketplace. It's not particularly interesting. There's someone who does things way better. And in one of the most uh, dramatic times when I did this <laughs> was, was for, in the Netherlands for spa mineral water. Okay. And what was interesting about it was that, of course, in Belgium, where Spa comes from, uh, mineral water is supreme, it's very important, and so on. In the Netherlands, we actually had a dog in the screenplay, which was the Dutch water company, because the Dutch will say, I don't need mineral water, I just get it from the tap. So the dog was this raided beast that would come in and cause chaos and different things. And the question was, which character in the cast can control the dog? And when we worked through it, um, one of the things that... Um, was so interesting is that we put in only one, oh, there's two or three, sorry, other, other brands, but when we put the Evian character in alongside the Spa character, the sheer potency of the Evian brand was such that it was very difficult to cope. And this is something that you just doesn't happen in brand consultancy. So what happens if someone is five times the brand that you are, how do you, how, how do you make room in your world when someone else is, you know, you go to the party, you walk the red carpet, Everyone's going to photograph everything. They're not going to photograph your brand. So when you t- get that context, how on earth do you build a storyline which allows the brand who nobody looks at to actually have a place in the world alongside the superstar brand? This is one of the brilliant things about using the screenplay technique as a way of building um, brands up. So I- I'm a great believer in it. I've used it not only when you do a whole screenplay, I've used it when you um, you can do an individual scene for a movie. You know how you have deleted scenes on a DVD? Yeah. If you can't add an individual scene to a movie so it builds the story, they throw it out. So even an individual scene will establish the main characters and their interactions with each other. And I've also used it in research because people instinctively tell stories and they understand brands as people. So uh, on a project for the London Eye, um, they, uh, we, we set up a whole drama where James Bond or a James Bond type character is at the bar and three women try to pick him up. And one of them is the London Eye. And then we had a variety of people, including the British Museum, Madame Two Swords, who was really into bondage. Uh, <laughs> cause there's a dungeon, you know, underneath Madame Two Swords. And, um, we would have like the Tower of London, which would be very like the Queen. Uh, we could have London Zoo. It could be anyone. But when you tell the stories of these characters, each one has a unique way of relating to the character. And of course, the issue is, I'm trying to write a scene where the London Eye picks up the guy in a way which is appropriate to the London Eye. And how does the London Eye succeed compared with other tourist attractions? That's the pitch. That's the setup. So yeah. even research, when we had to go through an entire brand key in a, in a, uh, a session lasting 90 minutes, we were able to do the storytelling um, of, of a screenplay in one scene, even within that, and work within that. So one of the things we're looking at at the moment is a way of taking the storytelling and to put it into a quant format so we can actually get people to start to improve storylines. That to me, I mean, I, I was, I started this 10 years ago when people weren't even talking about branded content. I mean, it was wildly ahead. And I think that this technique should be used to develop the storyline for the brand for the coming year. And what's unique about it is it allows you to plot it in respect to other high profile brands in the marketplace where your storyline uses them and you take advantage of them rather than just competing. Wow. It's very, very, very interesting and I really, really enjoy it. It's uh, also interesting because I play a lot of games, tabletop games and role playing games. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yes, absolutely. 
And, uh, and I was at a recently at a European planning conference and I talked about that and, and I'm starting slowly, slowly to work on some kind of game or methodology, which probably would look very similar to what you're talking about because ultimately you're playing a character through a storyline in when you're playing a role playing game as well. And, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of similarities with the way that you write a screenplay because you write scenarios in a role playing game and you look at, you know, how to make it entertaining for all the different characters at the table how to have fun with them, and how to bring a whole universe to life for them. Well, a few years ago, I got to, I got brought in by David Borsola um, on a project with Ridley Scott Associates, which ultimately didn't go anywhere, but it was very I cool. remember about that project. I heard about it. I, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember the name of it. But the basic concept was that you uh, the directors developed a one-page uh, scene for a script, and then you send people out around the world uh, on the internet, in effect, to do pre-production and to find storylines, characters, and in particular settings which would work with it. It founded because uh, founded because the lawyers couldn't tolerate it because, in fact, who owned it and who could monetize it, and they felt that they would have an endless number of lawsuits with someone saying you owe me for the stuff I gave you. But the idea was that the funding would come from brands who would sponsor individual characters within it, so that therefore you would have a cast of five or six characters and each one would be given a storyline which would be relevant to that brand's storyline and the, the audience would know which brand it was behind each one. So there's two levels of viewing where on the one hand you're watching this great movie, on the other hand you're watching the interplay of brands and how the narrative affects the way that character develops, handles conflicts and all of those things. It would still be great to do. But the, and we used the technique basically to work through the half a dozen scripts that we had at the time. But the, I still think it's relevant for branded content. If you are setting up your brand for a, for your branded content for the coming year, if you are, I've got a, a, a corporate, um, uh, goal for, for 2016, how do you basically tell that story in a way that the public wants to pay attention to? Not just to make sure you look good. We're used to vanity projects with mainstream brands. That's why it's mostly so far. We actually want a storyline where we'll watch it because in effect, it's like charades. The brand says, let me play a part for you, which you will follow me doing it because what I do is interesting. Not simply that I'm great and I'm wonderful and you should buy me. That's why brands are so far. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we're going to start wrapping up. I, I usually finish with a couple of cool down questions, which, uh, so after the warm up, you got to cool down after all this, and usually cooling down with with ice cream. So, do you have a favorite ice cream flavor, or do you well, like it to start with? You might yeah, like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I should therefore tell you, I have some kind of um, uh, dietary thing or something. No, no, no. I would say chocolate and mint would be the flavor I go for. Chocolate and mint. Chocolate and mint's nice. Cool. And uh, so you've traveled quite a lot and a bit everywhere. Is there? One particular experience or memory or story or an anecdote that you, from one of your travels, that you'd be willing to talk about? Um, okay, yeah. That I'll, comes I'll, to, anything that comes to mind that you want to talk I'll, about? I'll give you one from Saudi Arabia. Um, mm. Partly it was just that whenever you, I, I travel, uh, it seems like people come out the woodwork, I end up meeting those interesting people, but often families get together. And there was this time when I was, uh, by the Red Sea, uh, we were leaning on couches and smoking from Hubble bubble pipes, and a guy comes up and says, I heard there was a plan to get to me. That was pretty cool. Um, but it was what happened later on the, the following day. I was due to fly out, maybe seven hours later, and they said, we got a new briefing. Can you talk to us about it? And, I'm like, mm, and, <laughs> and it was for a sugar, which was very thin. It's just an example of, uh, uh, to me, a, kind of a planner on the loose who has no time at all and you have to kind of improvise crazily. And I'm doing this cross culture. And, and they said, it's a very, it's a very uh, fine sugar and we need to come up with a proposition for the sugar. And I went, okay. Um, I have an idea. Uh, it's from Japan, but we need to check it out. Um, uh, you, you, you have arranged marriages in this idea. Um, and they said, would you use the sugar? Uh, in connection with this, and I'll explain the story in a minute. And, and they said, well, we've got a guy who's just getting married next week, so let's go and see him. So he's just finished because he's getting married. So let's go. So we jumped to the car and we drove through all these back streets and came to this guy's house. We got shown around his house. He's literally building a house next to his parents' house, moving in next door, and they've just got furniture and it's all terribly exciting. And I sat down and interviewed his mother about how she found the bride for this guy, okay? Mm -hmm. 
I'm in, I'm at the house, uh, and I'm interviewing the mother, uh, of this guy, um, who, and she's arranged his marriage and he's getting married the following year. And the idea I wanted to test was something I had heard because I was brought up in Japan. My parents were, um, uh, go-betweens for this marriage. And they had, um, gone along to this date where the, the couple had to uh, judge each other. And the guy got turned down because they had a cup of tea together, but he put sugar in the cup and he stirred it and he, um, <laughs> he lit the spoon and put it down. And she wouldn't marry him because she said any guy that would do that in a meeting so important, um, you know, he's a slob. I don't want to spend the rest of my life with it. So, <laughs> so, so that was, that's the story. And I thought the idea of sugar becoming such a key thing at a moment like that, that's interesting. Let's explore that. Mm. So mm. I said, um, so how did you decide that this girl was appropriate, was suitable? And uh, the mother said, well, um, I work at university. I've been looking for a daughter for my son for a long time. There's some very nice girls come to the university, whatever. And I keep my eye open. And I, I found this girl and she was great. So how did you make a decision? Well, my daughter and I go to the girl's house and she serves us a tea. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and I went, okay. Um, and what do you think of the idea of putting sugar in the tea? And it was like that slap. She said, there is no way she would ever put sugar in the tea. It's impossible. And I went, why is that? She said, don't you understand this country? Is it? Maybe the men go to sea, but the women spend all their time trying to lose weight, trying to exist on a diet, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But if a girl was trying to show that she's a suitable daughter-in-law for the future, she would give no indication that she ever touched sugar, because otherwise you'd think she's going to get fat, all of these kind of things. She, she would not touch the sugar. And I went, ah, but supposing she put the sugar into, she wouldn't offer it, but she puts the sugar into her tea, and, um, uh, and, you know, she brings it in, you wouldn't see it. She said, yes, we would see it. You don't understand. When we drink tea here in Saudi Arabia, the glasses are transparent. Yes. You can see the sugar in the bottom. <laughs> so in other words, a, a character assessment is being done on the basis of tea being served. So my recommendation to the agency was that the girl would put sugar in the tea for herself and she would stir it in. But because it was such fine sugar, no one would know that she had the sugar habit. It was like her little guilty secret. But the point was, she is still able to conduct herself in a, in a meeting which will determine the whole future of her life. But um, I, I was this, this was kind of the only interview I would ever be allowed, in fact, I wasn't allowed to conduct it. Uh, men are supposed to interview women in Saudi Arabia. But um, her husband was present, so it was all respectable, and he was very interested in what I had to say in joining the discussion. But it's an example of when you are looking across cultural boundaries, trying to find things which are taboo, interesting, which would get people interested, because the issue of how people present themselves, whether sugar is socially acceptable or unacceptable, whether people have secret um, uh, lives where they do eat sugar and no one else knows and so on, that's exactly what you're looking for, because the idea of a sugar being just fine is not very interesting as an advertising idea. Yeah. The idea yeah. that a sugar might be related to how the whole future of your life is developing. That's a much, much more interesting idea. So, you know, and I got lucky, I guess, because I knew a story from another culture, which I applied, and having kind of explored this idea, the negative to it was so strong, I, I and I never found out if the agency can say never made a TV commercial showing this, but the, the idea was that it, I'm looking for these um, conflict points or touch points between cultures because that's what moves us as people. That's what interests us. And when so much commercial activity is just bland and uninteresting, the more we can hunt for those contact points, yeah. we've got something to work with. That's it. Which you need. Wow. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, is there well, one last question? Uh, one other interest of mine in, uh, is gaming, tabletop gaming in particular, as yeah. I've mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, do you do you play any kind of table, like board games or card games or role playing games or have you ever? Um. Well, I used to do computer games a long time ago, and then the kids came along, and I wasn't allowed to. So I used to do that many years ago. But the tabletop games, the family still play tabletop games. But the purpose of the game is very much to to uh, bring people, you know, interacting together. Um, 
that's the whole point of it. Yeah. Um, so, um, there will be games like, the moon now, that there's, um, that's terrible. I, I can't remember the name of okay. it. Hey, there's one game called Cranium. Yeah. Which that mixes quite, up everything together. So you, you there's Play-Doh so, and questions, so trivia right. questions okay. and. Ne- never do this. Never do this. <laughs> I've been having a few drinks. Yeah. And I was playing Cranium. And this is the one where you have to draw something and the, uh, the person is, um, they are drawing, but they are blindfolded. Okay. Yes. And so they draw an object, even though they're blindfolded, you have to guess what it is. It's one of the training games. Yeah. I've been having a few drinks and I fell asleep. <laughs> I fall asleep far too much in the wrong places. And so <laughs> other guys playing the game were absolutely cracking up because this guy was saying, come on, guess, you must think, you must think, you know, have you got an idea? Just say anything. And he kept on drawing and kept on drawing where you couldn't see this. So just go, oh, no, like this. And I wasn't paying any attention to what he, <laughs> he just carried on drawing. You're right. And that's why he's never ever played training with me again. <laughs> All right. Uh, John, I'll, I'll, I will add links to your blog and website uh, on the show notes. Is there anything in particular other than the book that you're finishing that you'd like to talk about or promote before we finish? I think the Unbound thing I would definitely like to talk about. Um, that, that's where the book is, unbound.co.uk. You can People still can still buy it, right? Yes, you can still pledge for the book, and if you pledge for the book, you'll get your name printed in the back of it. So, okay, what's cool. not to like? So, that's, um, there's that, and there's the blog. Um, I think that's the, the main stuff I would want to talk about. I'm always up to something. There's always something going on. Um, but that will be quite enough for now. I'll probably just yeah. confuse people with the various projects. But I mean, <laughs> the, the thing which, um, I'm hoping to do is the memoir, which I mentioned, which you can read on the blog, mm. to publish that, because I'm trying to learn self-publishing. Um, so I'm hoping to bring that out soon. I'm hoping to write a 70-page book on how to use the screenplay writing technique so that people want to get hold of that as well. So um, hopefully there are things that people can buy because the, 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 the difficulty with this whole world of blogging is that there's so many things which people can get hold of that if they like something you do, there's no way of doing anything with it. I, I, I'll give you one more thing, actually. Yeah, sure. John Grant. John Grant is a wonderful writer, and you can look up his books. Yep. Uh, I have the green, mar- the green Marketing Manifesto, which is one of That's it. Well, he, he wrote a book called The Brand, um, uh, the, the Brand, uh, I think I've forgotten this. It's not Brand Marketing Manifesto. But anyway, it's, it's the, um, but it's the one about brand ideas. Okay. And it comes with a chemical table of, of brand ideas. And he has produced a card set, which allows you to, um, uh, deal with cards. And you use, you look at the brand ideas which are already working in your category and which competitors are using, and maybe the ones you're used to using. And then you can look at some of the other ones. It's a great way of work very quickly brainstorming ideas for, uh, that you would never, never otherwise consider. So, um, the brand innovation manifesto, that's the name of the book. And the cards are, um, it's a card set. They cost 25 euros and um i sell them off my website um and i can obviously put a link on if that's helpful to people sure. but i always send the chemistry table even if you haven't got a book i will always send the whole chemistry table so you can see how they fit and the great thing about the table is that it shows you two brands who use that brand idea so it's a great way to do ideas for the fantastic okay. all right i'll add all of, all of those the links and information well thank you right. again for your time john it's been really a pleasure and uh bye see you soon thank you talk soon all the best all right bye Well, that was our show. If you enjoyed it, and of course, I hope you did, don't forget you can subscribe to the podcast via iTunes or Stitcher or whatever your favorite podcast application service is. Take a few minutes to post a review. I know that iTunes is generally the most popular one, and as I think I've said in the beginning, we've we've just been noted as the new and noteworthy section, so any review or rating that you can give us really, really helps. Uh, It helps new people discover the show. If you didn't enjoy it, just send me an email or send me a tweet and tell me why and give me feedback because I want to learn. I want to get better at this, of course. You can find all my details. You can find more. You can subscribe to the newsletter that you can get weekly on Sundays uh, on the website. That's www.icecreamforeveryone.net. All the words spelled out, icecreamforeveryone.net. Of course, if you're looking for any kind of strategy uh, with your branding, you need help with your communication, just give me a shout. I'm always happy to help. 
uh, and uh, always, you know, looking for new clients, looking for new opportunities. So yeah, please get in touch with any questions. I'd be glad to answer them. Thanks again for listening. I really, really appreciate your time and uh, until next time.